Good evening, everyone. I'm speaking into the line here. My computer is playing games with me this morning. I wanted to read Psalms 8, verses 3 through 5. <clears throat> when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visited him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Always been one of my favorite verses. Good evening, everyone. It's wel welcome to our Bible study tonight. We're going to be in, uh, I believe, Acts 19 and the first few chapters of 1 Corinthians. And it's going to be a good study. We're going to have one song by Gary Smith, and then we'll have an opening prayer by Matthew Connolly. And then Bill Robinson will have a lesson today. Over to you, then, Gary. Okay. All right, everyone. We are going to sing number 22 from the Burgundy Hymnal. Um, number 22, he is in our midst. So, so draw from the springs of salvation, give thanks to his great and holy name. Make known his deeds among the people. Make known his exalted work. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord and shout him forth for joy. For the Holy One is in our midst. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord and shout him forth for joy. For he is in our midst. Call on his name with thanksgiving. Yes, joyously praise his name in song. Live the be honored on salvation. Do the be to give his son. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord and shine bright for joy. For the Holy One is in our midst. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord and shine bright for joy. For he is in our midst. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our gracious, loving, holy, and merciful Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful to you this evening for all you have provided for us this day. We are grateful, Master, that you have provided us a way of coming together to offer praise to your holy name. We are grateful that we have Brother Bill tonight to share your word with. We pray that he might have a good re recollection of the things he's prepared to share with us. But also we'll offer prayer on behalf of all of those among us who are sick and suffering. We're especially mindful of Sister Helen Stewart, Sister Johnny Mae White, Brother Mike Hunt up in Tennessee. We have to pray for your mercy toward them. We pray that you continue to comfort those who have lost loved ones. We're seeking all of these things through the name of your loving son, Jesus, who died to make it possible that we could come to you in such a way. In his holy name we pray. Amen. All right, good evening. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, we'll begin there by looking at some things relative to that. There is this uh, point to be made that Paul spent these two years in Ephesus, and so it is for that reason and some other things that we can point out from 1 Corinthians 16 that seemed to indicate that he wrote from Ephesus while he was here during this period of time. Uh, so that being said, we began in verse 10, and it said, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. I think you want to underscore that word extraordinary. In other words, God was working in ways that were more than just the miracles. I mean, the miracles themselves, obviously, but here God was working miracles that 
uh, were pretty intense, pretty powerful, pretty evidence of, of who he was. And I think it leads to some things that we read about in this text. So that even handkerchiefs, you see, so even handkerchiefs. Uh, Luke notes the extraordinary nature of these miracles that Paul was uh, performing. So he says, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched their skins were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to evoke the, invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And so seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And he and, and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And I think here's where I would say to you, uh, you know, it says that all who were in Asia heard the word. I mean, that's, that's Luke's understanding at, you know, in view of everything that's happened here. I mean, he wasn't just saying when he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months and so forth, that everybody in Asia, I think Luke is just writing as to what took place. He, he writes the same way that we would talk. He writes the same way and illustrates the same way that we would. And so that I think this is part of the reason that people heard uh, the message that Paul was preaching. They heard about these events. And then you have uh, what took place next. And, the, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So people spent a lot of money on books in those days too. Uh, my wife is over here grinning at me. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. I think that's what we see out of this text. That's being emphasized. They heard the word of the Lord. Uh, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus. Uh, the number of those, who, uh, the, the believers had become believers. And the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Uh, if I could just leave a lesson here with you or something to impart as far as an application. I think that there is probably in the church a lack of confidence in the power of God's word to transform and to change the hearts and lives of men and women. And we're not giving people a chance to hear the gospel because we've made up their mind for them. As we pointed out last week, Paul deliberately stayed in Ephesus because of the culture that was there that was so ungodly and immoral. And he saw it as a great opportunity. And he wasn't making his mind up for them. He had more faith in the power of God's word to prevail mightily. So during this period of two years is probably when Paul wrote uh, 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Corinthians a few months later. Now there's also, I might add, there's also uh, some missive or epistle or some letter correspondence that Paul had with Corinth that we don't have a copy of. We're not, we're not aware of it. And we'll see that in just a moment in 1 Corinthians uh, 5, where he mentions some things and some other places as well. But it wasn't necessary for us to know. We, what we know we have in 1 Corinthians, and uh, it's an interesting book in a lot of ways. It's the longest of all the epistles of Paul, 16 chapters in all. And so uh, as we take a look at that and begin. Uh, here we go. So we have in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and 
I was hoping that this would really be uh, bright red for you so that you'd stay awake while I was going through this. Uh, they couldn't, couldn't, this wouldn't cause you to go to sleep. You know, this red is pretty powerful, it's power. There was, there was sort of a play on that. I mean, you know, red is the color of power. You'll notice Trump always wears a red tie. Uh, and George Bush wore a lot of red ties. Me, that is isn't May. That's just a fashion point I'll make for you. I'm not even going to charge you for it. So when we look at the Gospel of Corinth, uh, of, of to the First Corinthians, it's what he, what really is at play here in the first four chapters is the relevance and power of the gospel. And so I think that's a fairly decent lead-in from reading from Acts 19 and talking about how the word grew mightily and, and so forth, and then to talk about the relevance and power of the gospel. And so when we go through this outline, I think one of the things that we recognize about the Church of Corinth, I mean, this is what, what we're reading about in 1 Corinthians is Christianity in its social setting. That is, in its culture. And what happens when Christianity is in its culture? Corinth is a plagued church in a lot of ways. I mean, from the very first chapter, verse 10, and then all the way through, there are problems in every chapter of some sort. Now, the climax and the solution to that, those, these problems are, is coming up. And I, uh, and I might just say to you that, that the uh, 1 Corinthians 3 through 6 seem to be very personal chapters with Paul. These are personal things that he addresses. They're pretty, I'm just going to tell you that they're, they're pretty straightforward and, and they deal with sexual immorality. And uh, which was a bit of a problem in Corinth. I mean, just across the way from Ephesus and so forth, as we talked about last week. And Paul is in the midst of Ephesus. And so, uh, you know, where they worshiped in Corinth, they worshiped Aphrodite. In Ephesus, they worshiped uh, Diana. And so you can only imagine that. We always, and people always become in character like that which they worship. And so they became a very sensuous people as well. So this is the, the, where Paul is sending the gospel. This is where Paul sends, later on, is going to send Timothy and Erastus as well into that culture to go to Corinth and uh, preach the gospel and, and to help them. So he begins in chapter one and two, and I, which I think is important, just the typical salutations that we're normally familiar with in Paul's epistles. There isn't anything here that's any different than most of them. Uh, you know, the only exception really to Paul's salutations is the book of Galatians, where when we were there last week, we showed he just jumped right into it. He didn't, he didn't give him the standard greeting and so forth. And then uh, in chapters in verses four through nine, you have his thanksgiving for Christ's sufficiency. Anybody want to venture a guess why I have verse nine in a different color and underlined on this outline right here? Let me just read uh, verse nine. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why, why would I underline and, and, and put that in a different color? Anybody want to venture a guess? I think it has to do with the fact he mentions that, uh, he says the fellowship of Jesus Christ, and later, later he's talking about, in like section in verse, in verse starting in verse 10, you talk about how, how they're divided on, on, who on like who who they who leads them okay i mean i think you're kind of headed in the right direction in that anybody have i mean there's not really a wrong answer to this i mean having read the book if you've read the book of, or the letter to first corinthians would you 
thank God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And here's my point. In reading the book of 1 Corinthians, with all of the problems that they were having, how many of us would call it a sound church? I don't think if we had a church like Corinth in the city of Montgomery, we would consider it a sound church. And yet, the Apostle Paul says here, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, it's sort of like doing the typical exercise when you get to the seven letters of the churches of Asia. If, if you had a choice of being a member of any one of those churches, which one would you be a member of? And um, so if you came to town and there was a choice between the church like Corinth or a church like uh, a good, strong, vibrant church, let's say Perry Hill Road, which one would you choose? Yeah, it, it would it would cause us to think, wouldn't it? I mean, and that's the point, though, that uh, <clears throat> here is this church that is extremely troubled, uh, quarreling, fighting, not getting along at all, uh, mistreating each other, taking each other to law, uh, tolerating immorality. Um, you know, just condemning one another because of particular liberties that we have. Um, you know, abusing the Lord's Supper. Uh, they were misusing spiritual gifts. Their assemblies were disorderly, 1 Corinthians 14. They argued over, over, uh, over the resurrection. Chapter 15. So, you know, they were a church that had lots of problems. And Paul says, but God is faithful through whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. So he considers them to be in fellowship with Jesus in spite of these challenges, in spite of all these difficult things. He considers them to be a church that is longing to be in fellowship with God. Any comments or questions on that point? All right. In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 17, we have the divisiveness or the divisiveness uh, of denominationalizing. You know, the denomination, to, 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 the act of denomination is, to, is the act of naming. That, that's what that really means. You think about denominations of money. Dollar bill, five dollar bill, ten dollar bill, so on and so forth. So we name those different names and, and so forth. And so denomination is nothing more than the naming. So while denominations did not exist in the first century, the seeds for denominationalism were clearly sown. And it began with the attitude that some have toward the gospel and toward preachers and, and so forth. And that's how it begins. And so here Paul says, I, I, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment, and you see everything like Bill Robinson does. And we'll have unity then. I'm going to turn this light on. For me, I don't know if it helps you, but it helps me see better. So... Well, the problem with having unity about everything Bill Robinson says is the fact that Bill Robinson a lot of times doesn't even agree with himself. And so he finds, he, he oftentimes finds himself, meet, meets himself coming back and, and uh, not getting it right all the time. So uh, what's he saying here when he says in this text, I, I appeal to you brothers by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all agree or that all of you agree no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I mean, is he saying that we have to, to think alike? We have to talk alike? What's he saying here? 
Sounds kind of like a cookie cutter here, a uniformity here. Well, I think, Paul, oh, oh, go ahead. I think there's two, two thoughts come to my mind that one that we have, um, you know, a substantial degree of unity because we're all reading the same book. Of course, Corinthians didn't have that book. They'd all been taught the same gospel. But also that everyone is, if I can say this where it makes sense, in agreement on the principle of unity, in agreement that they need to be all following the same authority as opposed to what he's about to get into. I am of this teacher. I am of that teacher. Okay. John DeMoss, what were you going to say, buddy? Like one builds into the other. You build off of four, four and nine, and you go into ten to seventeen. I think where we start choosing churches because what makes us comfortable, or because of the demographic, or because of what it is, or like you said, a strong church like Perry Hill, as opposed to something that was here in Corinth. Um, I, I think that's just the beginning of denominationalism, even in a small part where you go, well, I just don't agree with that person, or I'm more grace driven, or lascivious, or legalistic or, or whatever. So I think that um, you kind of have to nip it in the bud to steal Barney Fife's idea and say, you, you've, you, you're, you're at the church you're at, you work at that church. If it gets bad, you stay there and you work through it. You communicate, you love on each other and you love God and you just make it happen. I don't agree with a lot of things, um, but we just love God. That's, that's, that's the two commandments, right? To, to love the Lord, your God, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's what we're here to do. Yeah. And I think, uh, I like Gary's point. I mean, I think he, he, I think both of you got it, but, uh, that, that he said it well, he, when he, when he said, I'm not sure that I can say this right, but no, he said it really well that, that to be of the same mind and to have the same spirit is to have the same mind and the spirit toward the gospel, toward the authority of, of God. It doesn't mean that we're going to see everything exactly alike. It doesn't mean that we're going to uh, agree on everything. You, you know, the interesting, interesting thing historically, um, do you know when division takes place historically? Division takes place historically. It always has. Uh, it's, you know, if you just go back and look through the 20th century and then up until now in the 18th century or the 19th century with missionary society and the instrumental music and then premillennialism. Division took place in the church, not when we were arguing with each other, but when we quit talking to each other. That's when division occurs. It's not when we argue, it's when we quit talking to each other. It's when we walk away and say, well, my mind's made up. I'm not going to change. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Well, at that point, then we're divided. Unity is a struggle in a lot of ways, but we have the key to it. We have the means to it through the gospel. And uh, John hit on the point, I think, that Paul is driving everything toward in this epistle that is wrong with the church here, and that is to come to 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter, at the very end, he says, you know, quit dividing over this, this gift and that gift and so on and so forth. Are all apostles? Are all miracle workers? Are, blah, no, no, no. But he said, I'm going to show you a better way, a better way than, than gifts of healing, gifts of prophecy, gifts of speaking in tongues. I'm going to show you a better way than all of the miraculous gifts. And where does he begin in 1 Corinthians 13? But with love. Love was going to be the key for them to be able to overcome uh, their differences, their, their challenges, the cultural things that were bothering them, uh, that were disrupting the, their assemblies and so forth. I mean, I think in 1 Corinthians 11, there was probably a, a mini women's liberation movement going on. And that led to some of the instructions that were there. I mean, I don't think, I don't think, uh, identifying with, with one's own autonomy and, 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 and claiming that I want to be autonomous is anything new. I mean, that's women's lib is not, uh, while we may have passed the law and legislation with the ERA and other things that is, is contributing right now to the problems that we're facing, be that as it may, 
women's lib has always been around. It began in the garden. Eve wanted to be li liberated. And so it's, it's always been around. It's been around in some form or another. And that's what a lot of the instructions of 1 Corinthians 11 is about, the first part, and why he talks about uh, what he does. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. So anyway, denominationalism divides us. And, and what Paul is wanting is for us to be united. I need to move on. I'm not going to finish. But if you've got a question, feel free to say something or comment. Don't, don't yeah, uh, let our time hesitate. We'll, we'll, we'll make it up somewhat. You know, we, uh, I know um, when we were talking about Gal in Galatians earlier, I think we kind of see there as well here, like the danger of put, putting, putting someone on the same, put on the same pedestal as God. Like, like when, when, when Paul talked, talked about how, uh, how he had to re how, rebuke uh, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that we can't elevate one over the other and uh, that we can't, and that's certainly a problem. I mean, preacheritis is a problem, isn't it? I mean, people have their favorite preachers. I mean, I tell young preachers all the time, don't ever go to a local work and think you're going to be everybody's favorite preacher because you're going to be sorely disappointed. I've never been to a place where I've ever, I've been everybody's favorite preacher. In fact, I've been a lot of places and worked in some hard places where I wasn't anybody's favorite preacher. That's part of preaching. Paul found, finds that out as well. And so here, the, the relevance and the power of the gospel. Uh, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 2 through 5. We preached a lesson on this a couple of weeks ago. But here, the boast of the Lord's elect versus the boast of the world's elite. And that's the important thing is to realize that, that it's because of the power of the gospel. We are God's elect, not because of anything that we've done. And this is the wisdom of God. This is the power of God that, that he mentions. And we don't have time to read all of this, but that's what we're looking at. And, and we need to have confidence in the gospel. That's Paul's point, in the power of the gospel, the message that's behind it. And so, uh, interestingly enough, as I said, all of these issues that they have boil down in, in, in being solved in two things. First Corinthians the 13th chapter where he talks about, uh, you know, if I, if I give all my goods to be poor and, and have not love, then I'm just like a clanging cymbal and talks about not having love. Love is the oil that, 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 that makes relationships work and, and go. And if we don't have that, if we're not tenderhearted toward each other, if we're not willing to forgive, if we're not willing, I mean, outside of, as I said, I think last week, a few things that I can't, it's hard for me to really work on with, is with people who abuse anybody, an older person, uh, sexually, spiritually, morally, any way abuse somebody. I can't hardly handle that. It's, it just, there's no excuse for it. But the other thing that, that really bothers me is the unforgiving spirit of Christians sometimes. That is, I can't think of, I can't think of anything that's more damning to a congregation than the unforgiving spirit of a Christian who will not forgive and who will not uh, treat somebody as they want to be treated. What he's saying is our boast is the Lord. He's made us the elect. We are not the elite. And quit wearing our feelings on our shoulders. Quit waiting for somebody to knock them off so we can jump up and say, you know, well, they did this to me, they did that to me. He's going to deal with that in just a moment too. So then the next thing that we go to um, is the, the wisdom of divine revelation. I'd love to spend a lot of time right here, but I, I, I do want to read a part of this. Uh, beginning at verse six, he said, yet among, uh, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. I, if you just start and take a highlighter like I did, and I just went through every time I saw wisdom in here, whether it was the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God, how many times wisdom beginning in chapter 1 and verse 17, all the way through is mentioned. Wisdom, 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 wisdom. And the wisdom of God is what he's talking about here. Uh, yet among the mature, we do not, we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a, a, a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, 
they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, and this is a quotation from, from Isaiah, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Let me just ask you a question right here. Who are those who love God? Not a hard question. We know the answer. Everybody knows the answer. It's what you thought of when I asked that question. Who, who is it that loves God? Those who keep his commandments. My wife answered it. I could hear her. And so uh, those who keep his commandments. So what God wrote and what God speaks about in the gospel, at least in these epistles, uh, are, are for Christians. And that's who he's talking to. If we don't get it right, how can we expect the world to get it right? So he said, now the next thing I want you to notice in this reading in verse 10, these things, what things? The things that God has prepared for those that love him, that is for those who keep his commandments, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one uh, comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things, there's the word things again, what things? The things that God has prepared for those that love him, freely given to us by God. And we impart this, what's this? These things, what things? The things that God has prepared for those that love him. We impart this in words, Paul said, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Uh, to, to me, I mean, I've struggled with this passage a long time. But I will tell you that I think uh, the apostle is saying that, that they spoke in words, moved by the Spirit, that we could understand, but they were only going to be heard by those who were spiritually minded, who had a mind of the Spirit, who wanted to know what the Spirit is saying. Listen, God wrote the Bible in such a way that those who want to know what the truth is can hear him Believe it, obey it, and go to heaven. He didn't write it in such a way that he would confound people or destroy people. or anything. They destroy themselves. They confound themselves. He wrote it in a way that, that men who wanted to hear it could understand it. And so that's his point here. He said the natural person does not accept the things. What things? The things that God has prepared for those who love him. Those things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You, you, you have to have a desire to want to know spiritually what God is saying. You have to have that spiritual mind. You remember what God, Jesus said to Peter? When he, when he said, no, Lord, this isn't going to happen to you. He said, get behind me, Satan, for thou art a rock of offense, for thou mindest not the things of God, but the things of men. Peter was not in tune spiritually with what Jesus had just said, that he must, go to, he must go to Jerusalem, be crucified and delivered up and so forth. He wasn't in tune with that. And so I think that's the point that he's making here. People are not going to hear the word of God who don't, are not going to believe it. They're not going to accept it who don't want it. So uh, that, I think that's an important lesson for us to understand. Feel free to jump in. I'm going to keep right on going. Uh, if you want to stop me, because I, I do want to come back to 1 Corinthians 1 in just a moment if I have time. Marks of immaturity is what the third chapter is all about. Now, from chapter 3 through chapter 6, as I say, appears to be more personal with Paul and what he's driving at, getting at personal issues that they have. Chapter 7 forward then, Evidently, somebody, some of these people, as you read in 1 Corinthians 16, while he was in Ephesus, had brought him some questions that they were struggling with. So chapter 7, on through the rest of the book, are dealing with questions, are dealing are, are answers to questions that, that they brought to him. But these chapters 3 through 6, then, he speaks to the fact that they are just immature, whereas there is, uh, he said in verse 1, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for you're not ready, to, ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you see, 
You want to impede the growth of a local congregation? Let there be strife and jealousy. Let there be the lack of leadership. And you will stymie the growth of a local congregation. Uh, as we're going to see in some other things here as well. Then he points out in, in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, uh, Notice what he says in verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Again, he's, you know, some were saying, I'm of Paul, others of Apollos and Caiaphas. And Paul said, we're nobodies when it comes to, to, to the growth of the church. God does this. We're just watering and planting. That's all we're doing. And uh, I love this statement, verse 8 and 9, for we are God's fellow workers. Think about that. You are God's field, God's building. We're fellow workers with God. You think about that? We're partners with him. I, I, I just think about that a lot, that, that we're, we're fellow workers with God. We're, we're partners with him. He's right here with me when I'm working and, and, and so forth. I mean, I'm not a, it's people would say, oh, what an honor to work for the president. What an honor to work for the mayor. What an honor to work for uh, some celebrity. I care less about that. I'm working with God. I'm his fellow worker. All right. Um, so these are marks of immaturity. Hey, Bill. Uh, yes, please. I was going to say, that's where that unity comes in. Uh, to be able to lay that foundation and each pe person build upon it, we have to be unified in the, in the direction we're going. Ex Amen. Amen. Who was that that just spoke? I didn't see him. It's Kurt. Okay. I didn't recognize the voice. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry about that, Kurt. Sorry. No, but you're exactly right. Uh, so, and he talks about the foundation in here, doesn't he? As you, as you point out here. Uh, he talks, and now I might add in verse 16, he said, do you not know that you are God's so Now he's talking to the church here. He's talking distributively. He's using the word you here as plural. Like he's addressing an audience of people, you. You know, sometimes I'll get up on Sunday morning and say you. And I'm, I'm not talking to one person. I'm talking to the whole group. And so here he's using the God's temple to refer to the church. He said, don't you know that you are God's son? The reason I'm making this distinction, because when we get to 1 Corinthians 6, he uses the temple, but he's talking about our body as the temple, individual. Here he's talking to the church, and that God's spirit dwells in you. That is in the church. You remember Ephesians 2 makes the point that we are being built up a habitation for God in the spirit. So if anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. You, 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 I mean, this is, think about what he's saying here, how precious it is. You know, people, all of, some of us and have lived long enough, sadly, to see the church divide in places over whatever reason. I tell you, whoever does that, here's what, here's what Paul says about it. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So he's telling them, grow up and realize who you are. You're God's temple. Okay. Um, and that's, as Kurt well said, that's the foundation upon which we are able to move forward for unity. Uh, marks of maturity, then. He turns from 1 Corinthians 3 now, turns to more direct approach on marks of maturity and talking about, uh, you know, our judging people and how we view people. He starts uh, in verse uh, three, uh, you know, he, you know they're, they're going to undermine his authority a little bit, but he said, this is how one should regard us, the apostles, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The word mysteries here just means that which has not been known. They were given the, the, the mission of revealing God's word, how be it when he the spirit of truth has come, he shall guide you into all truth, as he told the apostles. And so he said, We're, we are stewards of that mystery. Uh, 
And so in a sense, we are too. We're stewards of it and how we use God's gospel. Not that we're revealing something that has not been known before. We're revealing that mystery which the apostles revealed. And so he says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Uh, but with me, you think about the parables of stewards and so forth that Jesus talked about, the parables of stewardship and so forth, and how he dealt with that and what was honorable and what was dishonorable in those parables. And so he said, you know, if you're going to be a steward over something, going to be responsible, held accountable for something, you need to be faithful. Then he says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, uh, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not, uh, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from his God. So, uh, you know, whatever they thought of Paul, uh, you know, Paul said, I don't know anything that I've done that's wrong. If there is, you know, I would correct it. Uh, and I might just tell you that there's a, there's a point to be made here. And, and this is a point that I often make with younger preachers. Uh, that, because there's a period a lot of times in the younger preacher's mind and life when he goes through this struggle of how do I know that I'm right? How do I? I mean, even, it doesn't make any difference they're brought up in the church or they're just learning the truth. At some point, they're going to go through that. I think a lot of people go through that. I, I understand that. But for a preacher, it can be pretty serious if he doesn't know how to get a hold of it. And my point is, you know, I, I, a young preacher will say to me, do, do you think you're right about everything? And my answer to that is yes. I mean, yeah, I think I am. If I knew something I wasn't right about, I'd quit. I, I'd repent of it. I'd change. I'd, I'd stop it. I wouldn't do it anymore. Uh, you know, and, uh, but I, I would tell you along with that, there must be the attitude that I could be wrong too. And I, I emphasize that to them. That, yeah, as far as I know, I'm, I'm right about everything that I know of, but I could be wrong. But here's the point. My rightness is not going to get me to heaven. The grace of God is going to get me to heaven. And I need to have the right attitude toward authority, toward God's people, and toward myself. And that comes from the relevance and power of the gospel. And so that's a mark of maturity. And that's what Paul is reminding them of in this, this chapter, verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my children. Here he's writing to them as a father, speaking to them as a father. I'm writing to you as a, I, I, he probably started the church at Corinth and felt responsible for it and sees them as his children. He said, I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then to be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child of the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. And so he wanted to give them a model of what, what it is to be a Christian and so forth. Let me hurry through this. Uh, my... And so the Corinthians, he tells them in, in the last few verses, the choice is yours. Am I going? He says, shall I come to you with a rod or with, a, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Am I going to come and give you a good spanking? Or am I going to come to you with the tender pleas, pleading, or pleading, I should say, of, of love? Then they're confronted with moral issues. First Corinthians 5 deals with a man who has taken his father's wife and living in a sin that not even is named among the Gentiles. I mean, I think that's how horrendous it is. But I tell you, that, that is what I was telling you about, that the culture into which the gospel is going here. I mean, Corinth was every bit as bad as Ephesus. And... Yet here, the worst of worst sins, I mean, that a man would have his father's wife, meaning obviously his stepmother, and the, he knows her as in the biblical sense, and it's the spiritual failure of even social distancing. Yeah, I, I played on that, but um, they, they, they were puffed up rather than mourn, he says, that this man has done this thing. You should have put this man away from you. 
You should have disciplined him. Instead, they're trying to act like they're really elite. Look at us. We can tolerate this. We can have this man to, you know, we, we're not going to be sitting and judging them. We're going to accept that. Paul said, that's a, that's a huge fact. And then what he tells them, that there's a moral and spiritual distancing that needs to take place. And that is that they need to put away this man. Listen, discipline. Congregational discipline will always work. It will always work when it is done correctly. It will always work. Somebody said, well, it won't bring, it doesn't always bring the person back to God. No, but that's not the only reason for it is either. It is to put away, look at what he says in the last verse of 1 Corinthians 5. He says, purge the evil person from among you. It will do that. That's part of discipline is to put away that wicked one. I mean, there's a long discussion here about church discipline. It's for another time. But a lot of things I'd like to say about, about, about this text that I don't have time. Uh, you know, so if you've got a question or something about it, you want to ask me, um, you know, how do we treat somebody that, that's been withdrawn from in this regard, with regard to this issue? And, uh, you know, he said, with such a one, no, not to eat. I will tell you that in context, I think he's probably talking more about the Lord's Supper than he is in the social setting here. Um, that he's saying that we, we, we're not going to condone him. We're not going to in any way um, accept that and so forth because he talks about Christ, our Passover and lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival. And I think that's the Lord's Supper. So. Anyway, whatever, however you, you accept that, it doesn't make any difference in the sense that we cannot be lax toward those who are in living and practicing sin. And uh, we need to, the church needs to deal with them. And he makes a distinction between the world and the church that, uh, you know, he's not talking about those that are in the world, but he's talking about those that are, call themselves brothers that are engaging in this kind of behavior. Then he talks about 1 Corinthians 6, going to law with each other, another good subject to talk about. But I think what he's pointing out here is sometimes we don't want to hear this. Sometimes we just have to take it on the chin. Uh, you know, I, I was telling somebody just the other day, I, have a, I had a friend in Wichita Falls, Texas, when I lived there that was in the used lumber business. He, he would never, he never, he was, he had done quite well in business and he was much older. He's old enough to be my dad. And, uh, we were really close and, uh, he would not sell Christians anything and he wouldn't discount anything either to him. He would just give it to him. And his point to me was, you know, I, I just soon give them to them than sell it to them because whatever I sell it to them, even if I discount it, you know, it, it, they'll, they'll think I took, I don't want them to think I took advantage of it. Uh, you know, so I just soon they come and get it. I know, I know a brick house that he furnished all the brick for that was a Christian. The guy came over and asked him and uh, he wouldn't let him pay. He furnished all the brick and he was a Christian. So, you know, I'm not saying that's what we have to do all the time, but that, it's a shame that we can't treat each other like we should. Then he talks about abusing our liberties. Um, Peter would say not, wear, not um, wearing our liberties as a cloak to do wrong, uh, but that we can't abuse our liberties. This is another good text to talk about. So those were moral issues that we talked about. We'll talk about the rest of 1 Corinthians, or at least a good part of it on Sunday, I think. So I'm done, and I'll quit sharing here, uh, and you can have back at it. Who's, who, do we have a song, or John, or who, oh, okay. Yeah, so we have a song before uh, closing announcements. Uh, we're going to sing number 31, What a Savior.
Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, and look within good I see. God said from heaven, a loving Savior, to save a poor lost soul like me. Oh, what a Savior! was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed, scarred, his side was riven. He gave his life blood for even me. He left the Father with all his riches, with all this sweet answering. Down from heaven and gave his life blood to make the vilest sinner clean. Oh, what a savior! Hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed, scarred. His side was riven. He gave his life blood for even me. The silly waters I'll soon be crossing. His hand will lead me safe home. I'll join the chorus in that great city and sing of them forevermore. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed, scarred, his side was riven. He gave his life blood for even me. Let me say just a word before we have uh, Jim Keith lead us in closing prayer. It's really good to have everyone here in this way. We have not only our family together, but we have a few visitors. And I would ask all of you from time to time, send me names of those you would like to invite, and we'll put them on our mailing list and give them the invite. Uh, let's uh, continue to... Uh, Remember who we are and whose we are, and we'll have Jim Keith lead us in closing prayer, and I'll have a few announcements. Is Jim there? He is here. Jim, you need to unmute. You're, you're muted, Jim, I think. There we go. Okay. Our Heavenly Father, we come to thee this evening hours giving thee our thanks for all things you've provided for us. We ask that you continue to watch over us. We're thankful for this opportunity we have to gather together in this electronic method. But we we look forward to the day when we can gather together. In that light, we pray for a vaccine and a treatment for this virus that's going around. We pray for that, those people that are working on that. Heavenly Father, we pray for those of our number that are sick. Continue to watch over us. Keep us safe. Keep us from sin. For those things we have against us, we ask for thy forgiveness. These things we ask in thy Son and our Savior's holy name. Amen. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the prayer about 